Good evening, one. My name is everyone. My name is Keith Williams, and on behalf of the Lancaster Conservancy, welcome to Nature Hour. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. We were founded in 1969 by a small group of hunters, anglers, and naturalists who banded together to acquire and protect our most critical forests, wetlands, and streams with the belief that some land is so beautiful and rare that it should be protected for public benefit forever. Today, over 7,500 acres and 40 miles of trail are open for you and I to enjoy 365 days a year, thanks to their incredible vision. The urgency that drove our founders continues today as we accelerate our efforts to, to strategically protect and restore more fragmented forests, to expand and connect our existing preserves, to create new preserves, all while building out infrastructure like parking lots, trails, and signage that allows access for the public, while also protecting these amazing ecosystems. Nature Hour is a virtual education and lecture series with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help us better understand both the Conservancy's work and the work of our community and regional partners. In addition to tonight's, to tonight's lecture, we have one additional lecture at Nature Hour this fall. On Wednesday, November 10th, Dr. Dan Ardia from FNM College and Dr. Kim Winter from the US Forest Service will present a lecture entitled Bat Con Con Conservation from a National and Local Perspective. You can learn more and pre-register for this lecture on our website, lancasterconservancy.org under upcoming events. If you want to catch any of our past nature hours, you can always tune into Conservancy TV via the Lancaster Conservancy YouTube channel. We also invite you to support the Conservancy on the Extra Give, our community's day of giving, to help us save our woods and waters. The format for tonight's lecture is a 40-minute presentation followed by a 20-minute Q&A session. If you have questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our best to have them answered at the end of the presentation. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support. I mean, tonight we wanna to recognize our annual sponsors, Clark Associates, Electron Energy, Dart, Ratu Associates, Penstone, and Nimblist. Thank you to these companies for your commitment in supporting Lancaster Conservancy's work. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Adam Zern, the founder of Uncharted Lancaster. You could say that Uncharted Lancaster is where national treasure meets local history and geography, and Adam Zern is our own local uh, uh, adventurer that explores this history. But what does this have to do with the Conservancy's mission of protecting land forever? Everything. Humans have been a part of this landscape for eons. We're a part of the landscape and the landscape is a part of us. Each generation leaves its thumbprint on the landscape and the landscape, the nature and the ecology that form the feel of place, leave an imprint on us. We leave evidence of that relationship behind. When we protect land, we protect ecology and clean air and clean water and our quality of life. We protect the character of place from homogenization that often happens with development. But we also protect the evidence of our longstanding relationship with place, and that evidence that gives place a sense of character. Adam Zern, through Uncharted Lancaster, deciphers that evidence, deciphers those thumbprints left by past generations, and tells those stories of place in compelling and adventurous ways. Adam is a veteran high school teacher in Lancaster County, but he's not a history teacher like you might expect. Instead, he teaches tech classes like web design and 3D printing. These are the skills that he brings to his personal interest in local history. This fun and approachable online blend of information and adventure started three years ago when Adam needed a place to walk his dogs. He started at the nearby Shanks Ferry Nature Preserve, which is mostly known for its amazing profusion of spring wildflowers. And slowly he uncovered an incredibly rich hidden history uh, at that preserve. Among them, a 300-year-old cemetery, rumored ghosts, industrial ruins, the site of the deadliest manufacturing and accident in Lancaster history. Amazingly, much of that wasn't documented online in a way that was accessible and would facilitate visiting. <clears throat> Uncharted Lancaster is a resulting website and related social media account that takes that interest, gives it a gloss of treasure seeking inspired by his love of 80s films like Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Goonies, and sends it out to the World Wide Web where it can inform on the ground and armchair explorers alike. Adventures in SideQuest frequently take seekers to little known sites with clues that lead to caches of 3D printed medallions or other small collectible treasures. Other posts are purely informative and make sites that are difficult or dangerous to most to access like petroglyphs in the middle of the Susquehanna at Safe Harbor, easy to experience in a safe and convenient way. Please join me in welcoming Adam Zern. 
Hey, greetings, everyone. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. I am coming to you live from Uncharted Lancaster World Headquarters, which uh, may or may not just be an unfinished corner of my basement. Keith, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. It's great to see so many people from all over the country. I could see all those different places coming in in the chat in the uh, in the beginning. I'd like to thank Lancaster Conservancy for hosting this event because let's be honest, these fancy Zoom licenses are not cheap. So kind of get us started. I always like to ask the uh, the audience a, a simple question. So uh, for just kind of a raise of a hands there and I'll, I'll count them up. How many of you have heard of Uncharted Lancaster before? So go ahead and put your hands up so I can count them. No, no, seriously, put your hands up. I, I can see you through the camera. Even that guy right there picking his nose. He didn't think <laughs> I could see him, but I did. No, I'm sorry. I can't see anybody. The only person I can see is my wife right off camera here, and she is shaking her head at that uh, that terrible joke I just did. Uh, so, you know, what is Uncharted Lancaster? And there, I like to highlight fascinating pieces of local history. And so I've got kind of two macabre fun facts to share with you to kind of get us started here. And the first is... Uh, Revolutionary War General Anthony Wayne, and he is the only Pennsylvania who is physically buried in two different graves. You can find some of him in Erie beneath this blockhouse, and you can find some more of them beneath this tombstone in Valley Forge. Now, for those who aren't very familiar with General Anthony Wayne, here's just a little bit of information about him. So Anthony Wayne was an American soldier officer and statesman during the Revolutionary War. His daring military exploits and fiery personality quickly earned him a promotion to Brigadier General and the nickname Mad Anthony. George Washington considered Wayne to be one of the best tactical commanders and military strategists of the Revolution. Wayne was born on January 1st, 1745 in Chester County. He received an excellent education and began work as a surveyor for, of all people, Benjamin Franklin. When the Revolutionary War began, he assembled a militia and became a colonel of the 4th Regiment in Pennsylvania. Wayne aided Benedict Arnold, saved Washington's troops from a massacre at the Battle of Brandywine in September 1777. After the war, Wayne settled in Georgia on land granted to him by, uh, for his military service. He briefly represented Georgia in the House of Representatives before returning to the Army to accept command of U.S. forces in the Northwest Indian War. He defeated the Western Confederacy, an alliance of several Native American tribes, at the 1794 Battle of Fallen Timbers. He also masterminded the uh, Treaty of Greenville, which ended that war. Now, two years later, Wayne died on December 15th, 1796 in Erie at a, a fort there while on active duty, and he was 51 years of age at the time. Following his wishes, Wayne, wearing his uniform, was buried two days after his death in a plain wooden coffin at the fort's blockhouse. The top of the coffin bore his initials, age, and the year of his death in brass tacks. Now, had it not been for a strange twist of fate, Mad Anthony Wayne would have laid there in peace for eternity. But for 13 years, Wayne's remains you know, uh, remained undisturbed uh, there in a plain grave. However, there were those back east who thought his burial was not fitting for such a you know, famous general such as himself. So in 1809, Wayne's family decided to bring him home to rest in St. David's Church Cemetery near Valley Forge. When Wayne's son, Colonel Isaac Wayne, had the coffin opened in Erie, to everyone's shock, they found that the body was in an amazingly good condition. Isaac was ill-prepared to move this now decomposing body across the Commonwealth some 400 miles, and local physician Dr. James Wallace came up with a remedy. He suggested they put Wayne's body in a large vat and boil it to separate the flesh from the bone. Uh, the general's flesh and clothing were reinterred beneath the blockhouse. Meanwhile, Isaac took his father's bones in the back of a wagon and made the long 400 mile journey across the state along what is now Route 322. Now, you might find this hard to believe, 
but roads in Pennsylvania were even worse 200 years ago than they are now. They were full of stumps and rocks and logs. In the winter, they were muddy and ruddy. In the winter, they were frozen ice messes. When Isaac finally arrived at the gravesite and attempted to reassemble his father's skeleton, the family discovered to their horror that several of the bones were missing. It appeared that some had fallen out of the wagon while making the arduous trip across the Commonwealth. Isaac was greatly distressed by this turn of events and regretted his decision to disinter his father for the rest of his life. After that though, stories began to surface that every New Year's morning on General Mad Anthony Wayne's birthday, his, gold, his ghost rises and begins the long journey on horseback from St. David's Church to Erie and back in search of his missing bones. People along that route have insisted that a man clad in colonial garb has been seen riding a horse and stopping as if searching for something. Now, if you wanna find Sir uh, Matt Anthony Wayne yourself, you can look no further than the Lancaster Conservancy's Upper Hopewell Forge Sanctuary. And when you go there on New Year's Eve and when you wait till midnight, and if you're quiet, you might just hear him on his horseback riding along the road. And if you're really lucky, you might see his ghost ride by. So right there, uh, in uh, right there on 322 at Upper Holtwell Forge Sanctuary. So that's fun fact, macabre fun fact number one. Now, macabre fun fact number two happens to be this. And so first, let's mention the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. And it says that you can't be tried twice for the same crime, but apparently you can be hanged twice and it happened right here in Lancaster. So here we have poor Antonio Romzo and he has the dual distinction of being the last man hung in Lancaster County and the reason why all executions are now conducted in state prisons. Now, you might not realize this, but hanging a man is actually a kind of science. Uh, you take the man's height, and the weight, and that determines just how far of a drop the person needs to take in order to painlessly snap their neck. If the rope is too short, he's slowly strangled to death. And if the rope is too long, well, his head pops off like a dandelion, which are uh, neither are desirable outcomes. Well, on the morning of May 23rd, 1912, Tony's walked up to the gallows and uh, apparently prison food agreed with him because he's now 40 pounds heavier than when he went into prison uh, at the start of his trial. At 10.04 a.m., the signal's given and the lever is pulled and Romzo falls through the trap door. However, instead of snapping his neck, the rope breaks in two and Tony fell to the ground unconscious. As it turns out, the noose was made from a used rope so, so much for uh, Lancaster frugality. The sight was gruesome. A woman fainted, a man threw up. Eyewitnesses reported that Tony made a horrible wheezing noise. One of the guards ran to find a new rope while others tried to get Tony on his feet, but found that his injuries prevented him from standing. So the men found a board and lashed the half strangled man to it. At 10, 20, 18, at, at 10, 20, 18, 16 minutes after the first attempt, the guards tried again. This time, the rope held. Newspapers from across the state reported the horror of the botched execution. The following day, the state legislator voted to end the practice of death by hanging and adopted electrocution, thinking it was going to be more humane. They also moved all executions to state prisons. So there you go, there's two fun facts. Uh, that I like to highlight on Uncharted Lancaster. Now, opposite the history is the adventure side of Uncharted Lancaster. And there uh, is a kind of incentive to go and visit some of the places that I've talked about. I've created a series of treasure hunts and, and uh, Keith was talking a little bit about them. And if you can solve the clues and decipher the riddles, there's treasure waiting for you at the end. Now, nothing too glamorous, typically, 3D printed medallions or plastic gold coins or, you know, fake gems, but nonetheless, a lot of fun to find. And typically once a person finds one, they're going to do all of the adventures. 
Now, just this last spring, I did a real life treasure hunt where I gave away a thousand dollars in one dollar coins. Uh, when there was a six week treasure hunt, had people going all over the county to explore, uh, you know, historically and architecturally significant locations. Uh, here's the winners and some of the loot that they got, which included an 18 pound crate filled with over a thousand dollars in uh, in one dollar coins. Now, one of my favorite stories from this was we, we were getting our photos and we got all finished. And I said to them, "All right, do do you want the coins or would you rather the you know the prize in cash?" And it was a mom and her two college age sons. And the mom says, "We'll take the cash." And the one son says, "Well, uh, actually, mom, I I was kind of hoping we'd get the coins." And, and she says, "What are we going to do with a thousand dollars in change?" And he's like, "I, I don't know, but." It's kind of cool. And you know what? He was right. Thousand dollars in coins is super cool. So the mom says, we'll take the cash. So lots of fun and uh, gearing up to do another treasure hunt this spring. So definitely stay tuned uh, for that. And that's going to be an even bigger cash prize than, um, than last year. So, you know, typically once I tell people about, you know, what Uncharted Lancaster is, they, they next ask me like, wow, that sounds really neat. Where did you come up with the idea for that? So um, I've got my origin story, which has got a little bit of horror in it. It's got some spooky tales and some monsters. So uh, if you're brave enough, feel free to dim the lights at your house. I think all ghost stories are a little bit better around a campfire. So I'll get the campfire going here for us. And uh, we'll hear this, uh, my origin tale, which uh, it's got some spooky stories in it for you. But really the entire story begins with a dog. And this guy right here, this is my best bud, Indiana Jones. And you would be remiss not to do the Sean Connery impression. We're named the dog Indiana. Maybe go home now, please. The dog? <laughs> named after the dog. Yeah, so if you couldn't hear that real well, that was Sean Connery saying, we named the dog Indiana. And uh, and we did. And, and I think anyone who has a dog knows that a, a good dog is a is a tired dog. And so, you know, every single day after school, the dogs and I actually have two. I've got Indiana Jones and, and Turtle, and we we go for a walk. And I live really close to the Enola Low Grade in uh, in Colemanville. And we typically walk down the Enola Low Grade. And if it's a hot day, we'll swing down into the Shanks Ferry so the dogs can uh, cool off in the creek there. And I'm talking to a, a friend at work, and she asks me this question that forever changes my life. Because um, we're talking about, you know, you know, walking dogs and where we're going. And I tell it I'm walking down here in the Noah Low Grade and, and Shanks Ferry. And she says to me, have you ever been to the Benedict Eshelman Cemetery? And I was like, uh, no, what's that? And she goes, oh, well, it's a cemetery in Shanks Ferry and it has tombstones that date back to the 1700s. Well, this definitely piqued my interest. And I said, I'm gonna find this cemetery. So I turned to my good friend, Google, and I search Benedict Eshelman Cemetery. And for the first time in my life, I discover that the internet has no idea. And this becomes like a recurring theme with my adventures with Uncharted Lancaster that so often I find that the internet doesn't have the answer. The best thing that I can find is this old LNP article that kind of gives this vague description. And it says, up a mountain, through a stream, across a railroad, until the cemetery appears in a small forested rise in Shanks Ferry. And I definitely felt a lot like Indiana Jones. I've got this map with no names. And so, you know, call me Ishmael, but I decide that I am going to find this cemetery. I mean, how hard can it be? Shanks Ferry is only 92 acres. So every day after work, the dogs and I are crisscrossing through the preserve. And, and I'm kind of using that description like, all right, it's near water, near railroad tracks, on a hill. It's got to be here somewhere. And when I'm not physically searching, I'm online and I'm, I'm researching Shanks Ferry. And this, this rich tapestry of, of history begins to present itself. And, and I discovered that there's a lot more to Shanks Ferry than just wildflowers. There's ancient stone ruins and lime furnaces and dark, mysterious tunnels and, and train parts from accidents that are decades old, really spooky culverts, mysterious stone pillars, you know, standing in the middle of the creek. And probably the most interesting thing that I find and discover is this plaque dedicated to 11 men that died 
in a dynamite factory explosion. And you're probably thinking, why is there a dynamite factory in, in Shanks Ferry? And that's a great question. And the answer is this. In 1903, the Pennsylvania Railroad began this massive engineering project uh, with the goal of basically making a low grade freight line that's gonna go from at Glen, which is just on the other side in Chester County and ultimately go all the way to Enola, which is very close to Harrisburg. And this, this engineering project had a lot of ambitious goals. So one, it would have no more than a one degree change in elevation the entire route. And like I said, I walk this all the time. And at the end of my walk, my watch will tell me, you know, in addition to my mileage and such, my elevation change. And it often tells me zero, zero feet, you know, up or down on the entire walk. Uh, also, it was going to have no more than a three degree turn anywhere along the entire path. And so, you know, doing this required dynamite, lots and lots of dynamite. So here's some pictures from uh, that construction project that took place between 1903 and 1906. You can see how deep they blasted down in some areas. I believe the deepest is in Quarryville at 120 feet. Got a photo of one of the detonations there. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a series of men. And if you look carefully, you can see a lot of them are carrying boxes and those boxes are filled with dynamite. So this three-year project of the Enola Low Grade actually claimed north of 200 men's lives. And so during this whole project, newspapers were filled with these horrific headlines of men blown to atoms and, and more killed today. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a real bloodbath, this three-year-long construction project. You can go to uh, Safe Harbor and there's an old cemetery there, uh, what used to be St. Mary's Church, and there's a mass grave where 50 of these 200 men are buried, uh, and there's a, a plaque that commemorates that. So obviously a project like this, like I said, needs a lot of dynamite, and so you're going to need a dynamite factory. And here is a photo of the Shanks Ferry dynamite factory. Now, this probably doesn't look like a factory in the, the modern sense that, that we're used to. But again, these places are typically very disposable buildings. You would just use it uh, for a few years uh, during the, the lifespan of, of the project, because ultimately, the longer you use this facility, the greater the possibility of an accidental explosion because those explosive powders are settling on the floor and they're settling in the walls. And the longer you're there, the, the higher the probability of an accidental explosion. And so, you know, they built, they produced dynamite for the three year project for the Enola Low Grade. And at this point, the Enola Low Grade is basically finished. And now they've pivoted and they're producing dynamite for the Holtwood uh, Dam just a few miles south of here. Well, on June 9th, 1906, at precisely 12.42 p.m., the unimaginable happens. And that's when 2,500 pounds of dynamite suddenly explodes. People report hearing the explosion as far as 15 miles away. Many of you are probably viewing from inside this circle. And if you do, if you are, you would have been able to hear this massive explosion of the 2,500 pounds of dynamite suddenly detonating. Uh, closer, there a 1.5 mile shock wave goes out. And homes inside of this, people report having the windows cracked and broken plates falling off of shelves, and even a barn is dislodged from its foundation. But of course, the men at the epicenter of the explosion suffer worse. Here's a photo from the day after the accident. You can see the buildings are completely gone. All the trees have been, all the leaves on the trees have been uh, completely removed. Uh, you know, ultimately, uh, 11 men are killed, nine are injured. The newspapers are filled with horrific headlines of men being vaporized and turned to atoms. Uh, they bring a lot of the Enola low grade workers off of that project to be on a search and recovery mission. One man is quoted as, a, as uh, comparing the work to a chestnut picking as, as how large these body parts uh, they are finding. So these here are a photo of some of the men that died of those 11 and, and again, nine more were ultimately injured in that explosion. And so this is just a photo of, of some of those folks there. 
Two days later, they hold a funeral for them at Colemanville United Methodist Church. Of the 11 men who died, only one was ever identified by a scar on his arm. The other 10 were placed in a relatively small box, and there's a tombstone there still today that commemorates this, uh, this horrible tragedy and the 10 men uh, that are buried there inside of it. Uh, if you go and visit uh, Shanks Ferry, and it's getting close to the time of year where you can start to see things as the brush starts to fall down, there's lots of foundations and old ruins. And I think this one here on the left is actually uh, possibly some of the, uh, the foundations left over from the dynamite factory explosion on 19, in 1906. Now, if you've ever been to Shanks Ferry, you might wonder, well, why is there a ginormous tunnel there? I mean, it's big enough that you can have two go cars go through in opposite directions at, at the same time. And it, it seems kind of weird to have such a huge tunnel there for this you know, regionally renowned wildlife, uh, wildflower preserve. So, so what's going on? And, and the answer is that Shanks Ferry was once a, a vibrant community. And so its name comes from Henry Shanks, who used to run a uh, ferry crossing there between uh, on the Susquehanna between Lancaster and York County. There's a photo of what his uh, ferry boat might have looked like. That's one from the time period. He had a hotel and there's a, a photo of that hotel, which is very close to where the, uh, the Shanks Ferry parking lot is today. And this is a really cool photo because you can see the uh, Shanks Ferry tunnel in the background and above it. Is, uh, is a train going over. So I think this is a really cool photo. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but I know it's sometime after 1906 when the uh, railroad was completed. And, but before probably 1920, because the hotel burnt down sometime before 1920 there. But here's a photo of Shanks Ferry uh, with an old map from 1864, and I've kind of superimposed it on a, a satellite image. And you can see there, there's uh, where Grubbs Run is, you can see the hotel, you can see a bunch of houses down in there, we can see the railroad is coming through. 11 years later, in the 1875 photo, uh, here with this with the satellite image and the map, we can now see this narrow gauge railroad, this uh, the Grub RR there. And again, if you've ever gone to Shanks Ferry, and walk there on the Wildflower Trail, you're actually walking where that narrow gauge railroad used to be. So a lot of the stone uh, ruins there and there's some tunnels and pieces are, are all connected to that narrow gauge railroad that uh, went up and uh, mined ore further up in, the, uh, in that area. And again, this is all predating the, uh, the Anoa Low Grade. Uh, believe it or not, they used to dredge coal in the Susquehanna, and they did a lot of that right there at Shanks Ferry. So again, we can see uh, Shanks Ferry, we can see the hotel in the background. And so when they built the Holtwood Dam, a lot of these coal particles that were flowing down the Susquehanna got trapped in that area and to the volume that it was actually financially uh, profitable to kind of suck it up. And so for a while at the Holtwood Dam, they actually burned coal as part of their electrical uh, generation there. And so again, there's a photo from, you know, probably just before 1920 and then kind of right next to a, a Google Earth. And you can see like how much Shanks Ferry has changed over the years. I mean, it's all forests now. Uh, obviously, none of those houses, none of the uh, coal dredging operation is, is there today. So it should come as no surprise that an area with as much history and, and, and so much tragedy, such as that dynamite factory explosion and the Enola low-grade uh, deaths, that it wouldn't also have its fair share of uh, ghost stories. Now, surprisingly, there are no stories that I know of that involve the dynamite factory. Instead, they're all centered on that giant tunnel at Shanks Ferry. Now there's a couple variations of the story, but all of them basically involve this woman dressed in white. And in one version, uh, a murderer brutally ends her life there in the tunnel and her, and her spirits forever trapped in the dark and foreboding space. Some believe it was her husband who actually killed her. Uh, others assist that it was actually the woman's beloved who met a tragic end there in the tunnel, perhaps murdered himself, and her spirit has lurked in the tunnel for decades, mourning the spot of his death. However, the most popular version of the story is that a heartbroken and pregnant bride hung herself at the tunnel's entrance after being left at the altar. Now, regardless of the version of the story that you subscribe to, Summoning her ghost is the same. You go to Shanks Ferry, 
the closer to midnight, the better. And you park your car in the center of the tunnel. At which point you turn off the car and turn off the lights, which is no easy feat with modern vehicles today. You get out, you place the keys on the roof and you walk around the car one, two, three times. And if you've done it correctly and the energy's right, a ghost will appear. Of course, he's not always happy to have visitors. So, you know, I, uh, I wrote this story a while back and I, I published it and shared on all the, the local Facebook groups and, um, and, and I have this interesting experience with it. So I shared on one and Jack Ness, uh, he was a retired railroad worker. He just passed away this last year and he knew anything that was somehow railroad related here in Lancaster County. And he comments on the story and uh, and says this, and I'm going to read uh, what he wrote. And he says, um, so that's not the true story, and it's not the tunnel that's haunted. It's actually the the area above it. And he says, in 1974, a woman of about 18 was struck and killed by an eastbound freight train directly above the underpass on the ANS branch, and that'd be the Ackland Susquehanna branch. She was apparently clad in just a hospital gown and moccasins. No one could explain her odd attire, nor did she carry identification. Eventually, it was determined by Penn Central and state police that she had wandered off from a mental institution in Maryland several days before. Whether it was a suicide or accidental death, no one could verify because the engineer and brakeman of the freight train never saw her. The accident was reported by the conductor of the train who just happened to be standing on the rear platform of the caboose as they passed. After that, ghost stories abounded and crews reported re seeing strange entity dancing on the tracks in front of them clad in something white. Crews called her the White Angel. So um, I've got all these interesting stories about the tunnel. And like I said, they basically all involve in some form this, this ghostly woman dressed in white. And then whether the accident was above the tunnel related to the train or there was some kind of death or murder in the tunnel is all up for debate. But in my research, I do find this one story that's completely different, but still involves the tunnel. And so these two Millersville students uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, go down to Shanks Ferry because they want to see the ghost. And so this, uh, the one student says, all right, so we drive down there, uh, we park our car in the middle, we do everything that we're supposed to do, and we wait. And after about 10 minutes, this creature walks in front of the tunnel. And he describes it as being kind of gray and ashy skinned and emaciated with some long limbs. And he says the creature walks to the center of the tunnel, turns its head, and just locks eyeballs with the two of them. And so he screams like, go! And his roommate starts the car and they drive off as fast as they can. And he says, we finally get out to the main road before anyone says anything. And he goes, my roommate breaks the silence and says, did you ever see the movie Lord of the Rings? And so again, they're thinking they see like this, this golem-like creature from the, the Lord of the Rings. But I maintain they saw something, something else, something much more dangerous, and terrifying than, uh, than the creature from the, the Lord of the Rings. But to understand that, we first need to delve into the mis mysterious petroglyphs of the Susquehanna. What I'm talking about here are these, these petroglyphs. And some of you might be wondering, well, you know, what is a, uh, is a petroglyph? And well, that is a carving made in stone. And so here's my son and a friend, and, uh, and we're checking out the, the petroglyphs. And in order to you know, reveal the petroglyphs, you need a very sophisticated, and special tool. And that special tool is a wet sponge. So what you do is you take your wet sponge and you wipe it 
here on the rock. Helps if it's a, a nice sunny day so you can get some really nice contrast. And the, these images become very easy to, to see, a lot like what you see in uh, the National Treasure uh, movie. And so here's, here's that petroglyph that was uh, being revealed. And a lot of people want to know, well, well, who made them? And that's a, that's a great question. We've got our likely suspects, right? The Lenape, the Iroquois, the Algonquin, the Susquehannocks, um, but it's actually a group of Native Americans you probably have never heard of. And that is uh, what we call the, the Shanks Ferry people or the Shanks Ferry culture. Now they didn't call themselves that, we don't know what they're called, but the first recorded evidence of these Native Americans was actually made right there in Shanks Ferry. And they found evidence of a, of a longhouse. There's a photo of one uh, that you can go and see at nearby Hans Her House. And that's a lot of fun. And if you've never been there, you should definitely uh, check it out. So again, we don't know what these uh, what this group of, of Native Americans called themselves. And so right now we just kind of refer to them as the, uh, the Shanks Ferry people or Shanks Ferry culture. You can kind of get an idea of where their, their territory was. Uh, I've circled where the petroglyphs are. And so some people think that they might be some kind of, uh, you know, boundary marker uh, for these Native Americans. The petroglyphs are only about a mile away uh, from, uh, from where you would hike in, in Shanks Ferry on the Wildflower Trail, close to where the longhouse was found. It's even closer to where the, uh, the tunnel is that you drive through. And so a lot of people want to know, well, how old are these petroglyphs. And so most experts, uh, like Paul Nevin, I was talking to him in, uh, just uh, earlier this month and he runs Susquehanna uh, Heritage and he thinks they're somewhere between 800 and 1000 years old. But we're just not sure. These are literally prehistoric and not in the sense that dinosaurs prehistoric, but uh, prehistoric is they predate any kind of written history. And the Shanks Ferry people have lived here in, uh, in Lancaster, this part of Lancaster County for at least 4,000 years. So if they were indeed made by this group of Native Americans, they could be much older, possibly as much as 4,000 years old. If it wasn't made by them, uh, there's been indigenous people here in, again, what is now Lancaster County for 10,000 years. So there's definitely the possibility that these petroglyphs are, you know, much, much older than a, than a thousand years, but 800 to a thousand years is definitely a good starting point and by far makes them the oldest man-made artifact, you know, anywhere here in the uh, Susquehanna Valley. Now, if you want to find the, uh, the petroglyphs, Google is your friend. You can search petroglyphs and Google Maps will be nice enough to put a pin right there on the island for you uh, as to where to go. And uh, I get a lot of questions. People are like, how can I get out there and visit them? Uh, can I walk? And the answer is no, you can't. Uh, you're going to need a, a kayak or a, a canoe, um, which would be my recommendation. I wouldn't take your party boat or uh, your fiberglass speedboat out there. It is incredibly rocky and you will most likely just sink your boat uh, right to the bottom. But the only way of getting out there is likely with a, with a canoe or a kayak or something similar. So to get out there, uh, Safe Harbor is kind enough to have a nice little canoe launch and you can you know, shove off there from uh, the Conestoga and head straight out to Indian Rock. And uh, here's a picture of me on my maiden voyage to go see those, those petroglyphs. And there's the pin of where I'm headed and I get out there and guess what? No petroglyphs. The internet is once again wrong with no idea where things really are. This is actually where the, uh, the petroglyphs are at Little Indian Rock and Big Indian Rock. You can see they're downstream. Uh, on the left, I've got a, a picture of, of the two. Now, I would say the, the two rocks are about maybe 50 to 60 yards apart. I took this photo with a telephoto lens, so it really kind of smushes the distance between them uh, dramatically. And on these rocks, they are, especially Little Indian Rock, is just completely covered in petroglyphs. Here's a diagram from an archaeological uh, report that was done in the 30s. I've updated it a little bit to kind of show where the water level is now on most days due to uh, the Holtwood Dam. And Little Indian Rock has tons of carvings on it. There's animal tracks such as turkey and deer prints. Uh, there's even footprints. And so here I am just kind of putting my foot next to it, just kind of give you some scale. Uh, you can see I'm not wearing anything on my feet. A lot of people consider this to be like a sacred or holy space. So I always take my shoes off uh, when I'm visiting the uh, Little Indian Rock and Big Indian Rock. There's humanoid figures such as, such as this. Um, and this is one of the cool ones here. There are these two squiggly lines, uh, could be a riverbank or a snake, possibly both definitely has a snake. It's got a head 
and, and a tail. Uh, but it's this petroglyph and the next one that really puts to rest this idea that maybe the petroglyphs are just kind of Native American graffiti. I mean, what does a teenager do a thousand years ago? There's no iPhones, there's no Xbox, there's no internet. You know, I, I've got a kid like, you know what, you were bugging me, go out in the middle of the river and go carve on the rock. Um, but, but petroglyphs like this really put this, uh, that theory to, to rest. So on the equinox sunrise, uh, the sun sets, the sun rises directly between those two squiggly lines. At a slightly different angle is uh, the single one, again, riverbank or a snake. And this lines up with the winter solstice sunrise and the summer solstice sunset. And so again, this is made by a group of people who are completely in tune with their natural environment and just you know everything around them. They know where the stars and the moon and the sun are going to be, and they know all the animals and creatures that live, you know, that they live amongst there in the uh, in the Susquehanna Valley. A little further downstream is the larger Big Indian Rock. Um, it's it's easier to find because it it matches up its name. It's much bigger. Uh, you can see in the photo there. There's two logs on it right now. There's there's only one. Again, these these high these floody marks uh, kind of move stuff uh, around. Again, we can kind of see the diagram there, and I've updated to kind of show where the water level uh, and how it affects that uh, that petroglyph there. Um, Big Indian Rock has far fewer petroglyphs, but there's a lot of neat ones, and and I want to focus on uh, two of them here in a moment. And so this here is one of my favorites. And I, I see it personally as a, as a man in a canoe or a person in a canoe. It looks like a little bird kind of flying overhead. Paul Nevin believes it might be a woman giving birth. He says below it, there's, a, there's another petroglyph and he thinks that's the baby, uh, you know, after the woman there is giving birth. There's lots of four-legged animals such as this. This one happens to have a, uh, a long tail. The archaeology report done back in the 30s uh, says, you know, there were jaguars and uh, otters here. Um, so, you know, it could be any number of, you know, four-legged creatures. Probably not horses, though. You know, they wouldn't have gotten here till, till later. Uh, here's another one, uh, probably a wolf or a dog, possibly a fox. Uh, interesting fun fact, red foxes, which I have some here near where I live, are, are not indigenous to the area. The, the British brought them over for fox hunting, but we had other types of fox uh, here in the, uh, in the region. Lots of birds. I mean, again, if you canoe or kayak after the petroglyphs, uh, you know, birds and, and eagles and, and herons and ducks and all kinds of things. And so both little and big Indian rock are covered in, in all these birds or, or thunderbirds. And a, and a thunderbird is, uh, again, a Native American mythological creature, and it's large, and it's this water bird, and the, uh, the flap of its wing, that crack that it creates as it goes to take off, uh, is the crack of the thunder. And the water kind of, you know, spritzing off of its, off of its feathers is what's creating the rain in, uh, in many Native American cultures. But then we come to this thing right here. And so this is, uh, this is something that isn't as easy for us to uh, identify. And there's more than one, there's at least two. And we've got this, this humanoid looking figure. I think a lot of people look at it today and think alien, right? It's got the little antennas there, uh, but it's got like a long arm and it's got some kind of, of antlers or, or something. Again, people might think feathers, but again, Native Americans here didn't wear the big feather headdresses that we think of, that we might think of like with the, uh, the plains uh, groups of, of indigenous people. And so the question becomes like, what, what is this thing? Because everything else is pretty easy for us to identify, whether that's the, the animal itself or, or its track. And so there are some people believe that this is a Wendigo and this is a man eating creature. And uh, if you Google uh, when to go, Google will be more than happy to show you plenty of images. Uh, it's often, again, it's got the long arms. Sometimes it's described as having the head of a deer with antlers. Um, sometimes it, it, it doesn't. I don't know if one's male and one's a female version of this, uh, of this creature. But again, here are some of these Wendigos and they are described as having uh, you know, long arms and, and emaciated creatures, often kind of ashy gray skinned. And again, because sometimes can have antlers and sometimes don't have antlers. And so what I find interesting is that those two Millersville college students did not see Gollum from the Lord of the Rings, because that's a fict fictional story. Perhaps instead, they saw a Wendigo. And again, this is a Wendigo, this carving is made by a group of people that lived right there in Shanks Ferry, you know, you know, feet really away from where this tunnel is. 
there. And again, everything else they've drawn are things that we see today. And here is this, this creature that you know we can identify and made by this people that are you know very in tune with the world around them. So again, of all the scary things that might be in Shanks Ferry, this could very well be the scariest thing of them all. Now, on the topic of Native Americans, just a little bit further north, we've got Safe Harbor Nature Preserve, and that's a 213-acre property that Lancaster Conservancy has. And uh, interestingly enough, there in the hills in 1870, in the dead of winter, people there in the village began to notice these mysterious lantern lights kind of going back and forth on the hills. And at first, people didn't think much of it, but night after night, they would see these mysterious lantern lights out in the hills. And it turns out that these lights belonged to treasure hunters. And the story was that there might be $4 million in gold somewhere buried there in the hills of Safe Harbor. And these fortune hunters were out there because there was some magic guarding this treasure. And, uh, and part of this, you know, hunting for the, the treasure at night involved no talking. So that sounds like a great idea if you've got kids, go treasure hunting at night because you can't talk, it'll break the spell. Um, and they needed to spread salt on the ground to keep away the evil spirits and carry coffin nails, which apparently have some magical properties in, in uh, Pennsylvania Dutch uh, mythology. But uh, the, the reason they were unable to find this treasure is that it is guarded by a seven foot tall Native American spirit. And uh, he is said to wander the hills there of Safe Harbor, guarding this $4 million treasure in gold. And what makes it so unbelievably difficult to find is that he continually moves the treasure uh, every day. So even if you looked in that spot today, you're gonna, you may have to look there tomorrow because it could very well be moved to that spot. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, is there really any truth to that tale? Well, the, the, uh, the treasure hunters looking for it in the winter of 1870, 100% true. Is there a ghost? I don't know, but Right there where that X marks the spot near the bridge that crosses the Conestoga River is this mysterious stone with some very interesting carvings on it. So FS 1879, and it's got a hand pointing with a stone chisel uh, and a stone chiseling hammer along with uh, an interesting arrow. And to the left of all of those is this face. And some people think it might be, again, kind of the face of, uh, of a Native American. And some people believe that uh, this is like a treasure hunting symbols that kind of mark the way to uh, the treasure. So was the treasure hunters true? Absolutely. Is the ghost real? Not sure. Could there very well be treasure somewhere? Absolutely possible. All right, I'm looking here at my watch and I think we've got time for just one last haunted story here. And this one is going to center on the Helm Hills Nature Preserve on the other side of the Susquehanna in York County. And so there is the Seven Gates of Hell is supposedly located near a town that is today known as Hellam in York County. However, Hellam's name didn't start out so innocently. Just outside the edge of the original settlement was a bubbling sulfur pit. The boiling brimstone immediately made people think of the fiery underworld and people began to refer to the area as Helltown. Now, the name was eventually changed to Hellum through a post office related bureaucratic typo, but just off of Furnace Road in Hellum Township is a path barred by a red pipe gate. If one insists on walking the trail despite the gate, you'll come to another gate and another and another until you've passed a total of seven gates. These are said to be the gates that guard the path into hell. Now, in the 1800s, this trail was actually a road that led to a remote compound composed of a large building and several uh, outbuildings. The compound was actually an insane asylum that housed hundreds of inmates. The remote site kept the inmates out of sight and out of mind, but the locals weren't happy about having so many potentially dangerous people in their backyards. There were ill feelings toward the insane asylum and rumors were rampant in the area about escapes and damage done by inputs. In all likelihood, a few of the stories were true, but the rumors turned otherwise nice people into suspicious neighbors. It's said that one night, 
uh, the building caught fire and the local fire department was called in. From the beginning, there were problems. The fire department had to fight their way back along the narrow road with their heavy equipment, taking up precious time. The staff at the asylum were busy trying to get inmates out while many wandered the area and some got lost in the woods as they stumbled away in fear of the fire that was destroying their homes. Those on the upper floors were not so lucky. They were trapped and died of smoke inhalation or the flames. It was a terrible sight to see and the stench of burning flesh was gagging. Well over a hundred people died and many others were severely burned. The following day, the townspeople began to round up the patients. There were stories that some of them were badly beaten. Others even claimed that some of the inmates were killed by fearful townspeople. The asylum was never built and the inmates were moved away. The property sat, sat derelict for many years and eventually the township decided to place gates to block the curious from visiting the site. Through the years, new gates were added until the entire path was blocked by seven gates. The series of gates begat the legend of the seven gates to hell. No one knows for sure how the, uh, the story began. Was it the hellish nightmare of the people burning in the asylum? Was there really an asylum at all? Was it the name of Helm that first ignited the tale? There's no record that gives us answers, but for more than a hundred years, the stories have persisted. Generations of young people have whispered that no one can make it safely through the gates. It is said that strange fe fear grips people as they approach the seven gates. As they pass the first one, they feel that they should turn back. A feeling of being watched or of impending danger gradually rises as the second and third gate are passed. At the fourth, real fear begins and the only, only the foolhardy make it to the fifth gate. Here, the urge to run uh, from what lies ahead is almost overwhelming. What happens beyond that is anyone's guess. It's said that if you make it past the seventh gate, you will find the doorway to hell and the ruins of the old asylum. Has anyone ever found the portal to hell? It's hard to say because no one has ever come back from the portal with proof. Hey, so with that said, my advice to all of you is to stay out of Lancaster Conservancy's property after dark. They're not doing it to be funny. They're doing it because there are monsters and ghosts and things that go bump in the night out there. And it would behoove you to stay out of their preserves at dark because you never know what's going to happen. Hey, I would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It has been a real pleasure to talk to all of you. If you uh, want to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check me out on the web, you can find me at Uncharted Lancaster. I'm going to turn it over here to Keith uh, for some Q&A and the time that we have remaining. Yeah, thank you, Adam. And uh, I think so. I'm in I'm in the climbers run barn right now. I'm not feeling real, real good about this. So if anybody <laughs> sees anything popping up behind me, just, uh, you know, please let me know. Um, absolutely amazing stories. And I love how you know, this, this folklore just kind of weaves together our relationship with, with the natural world and how that's so, so um, influenced. But um, have you, in all of your explorations, have you had any ghost experiences? I, uh, I have not. I, uh, I do not go out at dark, though, uh, very often. I'm not one to, uh, to tempt fate. So I have not had any, any uh, personal experiences, but I've had a lot of people reach out to me, especially about that Shanks Ferry Tunnel. People have ridden horses through there, and they've said, you know, I, I, our horses go through tunnels all the time. They do not like that tunnel. Um, so I, I've heard a lot of stories dealing with that tunnel, um, but I've never had an experience myself. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty creepy. I seen that dude, but not there down at the Serpentine Parents just a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and hey, speaking of, you know, staying off preserve after dark. Yeah, absolutely. Great reason to because, you know, it's it's more than the conservancy is worried about that. There's a whole bunch of other creepy things going on out there. And also we can save people a whole lot of time from digging holes at, at uh, Safe Harbor. We just dug 900 holes out there to put trees in yesterday. There's no treasure there. So um, don't worry about digging a hole there. Um, the Wendigo. So is, is the Wendigo the same uh, as the goat man? Or is that something, or is that two different things? I believe that that pan ghost is, is a little bit different. So the Wendigo is typically described as, as being tall. Uh, and I think the half man, half goat guy is, is, uh, is smaller. So again, you're definitely in that, 
you know, cryptozoology area there, but a different, a different creature. Yeah. What's the, uh, what's the best time to see the petroglyphs? I mean, that, that is a really compelling story because of the petroglyph that's in the rock that looks like that Wendigo, right? Um, right. What's the best season to go out there and look at that? Um, so I typically go out late summer, the, the water flow, I always check um, Safe Harbor's website and they'll tell you what the level of the water is. They'll tell you how fast the water is moving. So, you know, you definitely don't want to be out there after heavy rain. It can get dangerous. Uh, the summer can be really nice because the water flow is, is actually pretty slow. It's an easy paddle out. Um, the best time of day, they say, is early morning and then like late afternoon because when the sun's at an angle. So you can get that that kind of the sun hitting it. And then again, taking your, I always take some sponges. I take a couple of little plastic buckets so I can scoop up some water and then wipe them on the, uh, on the rock there. Yeah, safety is definitely a big part of that going out there. Uh, having paddled that a couple of times, the flow coming out of the dam is really important to know. And also, you know, there's times when a lot of those rocks can be underwater. So um, if you don't check that flow ahead of time, it might be going out for no reason. And we just had something in the chat that's kind of interesting when I mentioned the trees and uh, uh, somebody said that, you know, 900 trees in the ground is the real treasure. Um, and I think I'm going to close out with this, this kind of point, right? So there's, there may be ghosts out there, you know, maybe, maybe real or imagined, uh, but the, the real ghosts are the species that we've already lost from this landscape. And you mentioned some of those, right? Some of the wildlife that used to be here, some of the wildlife that are, that are depicted in those petroglyphs no longer exist in this landscape. We've eliminated them. Um, and, and those, we can feel those ghosts. We can feel those gaps ecologically. Um, and there may, there may be, you know, gold treasure uh, buried up at Safe Harbor. Although the real treasure at Safe Harbor is the flock of meadowlarks that I saw flying over the meadow uh, this past Saturday. And it was the peregrine falcon that was flying over the, the part of that meadow that we're planting trees in to restore. And so the real, the real treasures are these places that the conservancy has protected forever for us to enjoy. And you know, not just from an ecological perspective, but from a historical perspective, from a folklore perspective. And so, Adam, thank you for weaving these stories together and all of those components that make this such a special place to be a part of, amazing community that, uh, that brings a lot of character to this place and, and that character that the Conservancy is trying to protect and, and restore uh, forever. Thanks everybody, have a great evening and uh, you know, don't get too spooked as you're, uh, as you're wrapping up your night. Hey, thank <laughs> you everyone.